Hey, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at home on your phone or on your computer. Jump on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. One thing we often say is you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us at one of our ACC Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to uh, be here with you. Um, Matt was a part of my youth ministry. I was a youth pastor at Big Valley. I actually got saved at, at Big Valley. I was a youth pastor there for 20 years, and then I, uh, we had some problems, if you will, <laughs> and uh, our elders asked me to become the senior pastor, which I served at for a long, long time. And then just recently, I got tired of all the meetings. Our church is pretty large. We have about 200 employees. That tells you how big it is. I just got tired of all the meetings. And I thought, man, I didn't get into ministry to sit through meetings. And so I handed the senior pastor's job off to another student who is uh, in my youth ministry, and he, he gets to sit through all the meetings now. And I just get to, do all, I get to do all the fun stuff. So anyway, you know, one of the things that's really fun for me is our youth ministry, for whatever reason, uh, God used it to um, really launch a whole bunch of guys and gals into ministry. And there are, I don't know, 15, 20 guys all over the country, just like Matt. There are senior pastors of churches that came out of our ministry. We literally, um, and it's always fun for me to go and see, you know, how God still use them. I never would have dreamed Matt be doing this. I, I, can tell, I can tell you, the reason why my hair is this color is because of Matt, just to be straight. I'm just telling you. Uh, but we have missionaries all over the world now, and it was really an incredible time to uh, watch God work in people's lives. And so, uh, if you have a Bible, you can stick your finger in at John chapter 16 and just kind of put your finger in there. And uh, I don't know if there's anything more weighty that I'm going to say than take your Bible and turn to. It's something you don't hear in church as much anymore. Take your Bible and turn to. And so I just want you to take your Bible and turn to and put your finger in there at John 16. I was, um, was asked to talk on a topic that I had to think a lot about when I was younger. When Matt was in my youth group, I was married to a gal by the name of Michelle. We had a five-year-old daughter. She was a nurse. And where Modesto is in California, if you go south down to L.A., it's about a five, six-hour drive just to get to L.A. from our city. And she was heading down to a uh, workshop. She was, uh, um, she was a nurse, as I said, and she was going to help a midwife uh, in her practice. And so she had to go to this class that was down south. She was going to go down, take the class, and drive back. My daughter and I ran over to a little department store, and we bought a whole bunch of new dishes. We were going to surprise her when she got home with all these new, new dishes and stuff. We were taking all the dishes out of the, you know, the cupboards, and we were going to put the new ones up. And I got a phone call um, from somebody. They had found my wife's Bible on the freeway. And when they opened it up, of course, her name was on the, the front of it, Michelle Countryman. And then inside were all the church bulletins or programs or whatever you, you call them. And so they saw Big Valley Grace and Modesto. They saw her name on the front. And so somebody had called the church and said, hey, there was a horrific accident on the freeway, and we found this Bible on the freeway. We, we think it has to do with a car accident. And so I got um, a secretary called me and said, hey, we don't know what's going on, but someone found your wife's Bible down in the L.A. area. And so 
I kind of began to make some phone calls to some emergency rooms, and uh, I said, hey, listen, I think my wife might have been in an accident. Finally, I got on the phone with a doctor, and this doctor said, uh, Mr. Countryman, can you describe your wife? And I did. Can you tell us about some jewelry she may have had on? And I did. And he said, this is what I want you to do. I need you to get into your car, and I want you to drive down here as safely as you can. And I said, hey, Doc, come on, man. you got to tell me what's going on. He goes, no, Mr. Countryman, I'm not going to tell you what's going on. I just need you to get in your car and drive as safely as you can down to this particular hospital or emergency room. So as I said, I had a five-year-old, so I hang up the phone, and I'm throwing a bunch of stuff in a suitcase. It was going to take me at least five hours to, to get there, and I figured I'd get a hotel room or something, and I really didn't want to take my, my, my daughter, but I had no choice at that moment. And literally, as I'm walking out my front door, two of the guys that were in uh, uh, volunteers in my youth ministry, Rich Sasser, who you guys know, and Mark Clements, who you know, uh, they came walking in. They were just coming over to say hi, and Mark's wife was with them. I told them about the phone call I had, and Tammy said, hey, listen, you three guys go. I'll stay here uh, with, with Megan. And so Rich Sasser was the battalion chief of the fire department, okay? He was like a big shot in our area. So we made our way down there, and when I arrived, a doctor told me that my wife had died in this car accident. I haven't told this story, I don't know, it's been a, been a, I don't know, long time, 15 years or whatever. But when Matt called and gave me the, the topic, and I began to think and pray and kind of spitball some ideas on a whiteboard about what maybe the Lord would have me to say, um, I thought, you know, maybe this is the moment maybe to share the story. Again, I haven't shared it in a long time. And uh, to say it was horrific would be the understatement of the year. I mean, it was a horrible moment in my life. A horrible moment in a five-year-old's life. Uh, even though she didn't understand uh, uh, much of what was going on. And of course, I began to um, think to myself, <laughs> man, my, my parents own a... a, a, a chain of jewelry stores, and I, I'm it. I, I'm the only son, right? It's a very lucrative business, and it was going to be, you know, mine to take over, you know, if you will, and for whatever reason, I, I sensed a call to ministry and, you know, went back to college and all that kind of stuff, and here I was now, a youth pastor. I for just told my dad, Dad, I don't want to do that. It's not what I'm supposed to do with my life, and here I was, a youth guy, making nothing. That was the, You're on the bottom of the totem pole as it relates to, you know, money and stuff. But which, by the way, though, if you're, you know, when you're on the bottom of a totem pole, when it falls over, you don't go anywhere. <laughs> you're, just, you're, just, you're just lying sideways, okay? Uh, and uh, our, 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 by the way, our church, you know, it fell over. There was a moment, that's how I ended up the, the senior pastor. But anyway, um, it was just God, I gave, gave all this up to serve you. I mean, I had these reverent conversations with the Lord. He, you know, his shoulders are big enough to handle your questions and your concerns, whatever. As long as you do it in a reverent way, he's, he's good with it. And it was like, man, you know, aren't I one of the good guys? Well, why did you let this crummy, evil, wicked thing happen to me? And, and, and I'm okay if it's me, God, but to a five-year-old? Who's going who's gonna to walk, you know, help her get dressed on her wedding day? Who, who's going to be that person that helps her learn about what does it mean to, you know, be a woman and when your body changes and all? I mean, I had all these things running through my brain. But the big one was, was God, you come on. Why are you allowing this evil thing to, to happen to me? And probably most of you, I don't know, 96.8% of you, have probably had a moment like that. 
or something really crummy happened to you. It could have been a death of a loved one, a spouse, a child, a parent, a grandparent, so, someone really close to you, and you thought, man, why? He, he was, he's a good guy. He's a good gal. I'm thinking, man, my wife died, and, you know, I don't know, hell's angels are out there selling crack to kids, and, and they're, they're healthy as oxes. This doesn't make any sense to me, right? We probably all had moments uh, like that. Jesus makes an incredible promise to all of us. There's lots of promises found in this book. It's full of promises. It's just full of promises. There is one promise that's the weirdest, the wackiest, the craziest promise in here. In fact, our church, uh, one year, we, we got these bread baskets, okay? And, uh, and you opened the bread basket up, and you, you pulled out this piece of paper, and in it was a promise from God. And the whole thought was, every day, you know, wake up, Big Valley Grace family, open the bread basket, pull the promise out and read it, and that would encourage you for the day. This promise that Jesus makes wasn't in there. You can buy calendars where you rip off, you know, every day, and it's got a promise from God. You'll never find this promise, but it's a promise nonetheless. Jesus said, in this world, you will have troubles. Now you can see why, you know, in the bread basket, hey, you know what? It's not encouraging. I don't, want to, I, don't, I don't want to know that. I'm one of the good guys. I've denied myself. I've taken up my cross, and I'm following you. I've surrendered my life over to you. And here we have our Lord saying this to us. In this life, the standard equipment is troubles and trials and titty punches and bummers. It's a promise. In fact, it would have been really fun if we had the time to put a microphone up here and let every single person in here walk up to the mic and share what the trouble is you're going through this week. And if you're not in any trouble, buckle your seatbelt, because tomorrow's a new day. Right? I mean, it's going to happen. But isn't that a weird promise? One of the things that I love about the Word of God is that Jesus just kind of tells us, his people, his kids, just wants you to know, on this globe... While you're walking around, sucking in on the air, eating the food, and doing stuff, you're going to experience bummers and trials and kidney punches. In other words, bad things are going to happen. It's going to happen. So back to the question, why does a loving God allow bad things to happen to good people? Well, I'm not sure I have a good answer. I think this is the one topic in the series um, where what the great prophet, God said through the great prophet Isaiah probably holds true. In Isaiah 55, God says, my, my thoughts aren't your thoughts, and my ways aren't your ways, declare the Lord. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts than yours and my ways than yours. In other words, what God is saying through the pen of Isaiah is, is you ain't God. You don't think like me. You don't reason like me. You don't do things like me. Moses said in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord. And there are some things that are secret to only Him. 
And he doesn't let you, as great as you are, as fantastic as you are, as educated as you are, as special as you are, there are some things he chooses not to let you in on. Because he doesn't think like you, and he doesn't reason like you. But I do want to give this a shot. I think the question's flawed. Why does a loving God allow bad things to happen to good people? Good people? What makes you think you're good? Well, you don't know me, Pastor Rick. If you, you could spend an afternoon with me, you'd see how good I am. Jesus was asked a, a question in Luke chapter 18. It says this in verse 18, And a rule, ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a great question. Jesus' answer is really bizarre. Okay? It's just really weird. Jesus said, well, Why do you call me good? No one. And in the Greek, let me tell you what no one means. No one! What do you mean, what about me? No one is good except God alone. Now that's an interesting thought. Doesn't that mess with your ego? What do you mean I'm not good? I'm not telling you you're not good. I'm just going by what the scriptures say. In Ecclesiastes, the wisest man that ever lived said this, there's not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. In other words, when you give your life to Christ, when you became a follower of the Lord, right, when you denied yourself, you took up your cross and you followed him, that's what made you righteous. But Solomon says that there isn't a righteous man or woman who doesn't sin. In Romans chapter 3, Paul says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Our brother John penned these words, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Paul comes back around in Romans 7 and says, And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, my flesh. Obviously, the Holy Spirit who lives in us is good. He's talking about our flesh, this thing here. This is the headquarters of sin. That's why this doesn't get to go to heaven. This just ends up in a pine box, right? Six or eight feet under the ground. You'll get a new one of these. All this body does is connect us to the physical Now, it's a beautiful thing because it houses the Holy Spirit, right? But you can just go through the scriptures and see that what the Bible teaches, and I know some of you are not going to like this. The Bible teaches that all of us are evil. Some are more evil than others. You know, there's no Charlie Mansons in here, right? (laughs) No, not. I mean, you're not as evil as Charlie Manson. You're not as evil as Hitler. I get it. But make no mistake about it. The Bible is crystal clear. We are all evil to some degree. Some are just more evil than others. We're not all good. And some are better than others. That's a modern, maybe pop psychology might teach us. We're we're just really goofed up people. Evil people. So it might be more accurate to ask, why does a loving God allow good things to happen to bad people? Like you and I. That might be a better question. Why does this good, good God, and we were singing songs to how good he is. Why does this good God, this holy God, this righteous God, this unbelievably majestic God, 
allow good things to happen to us, bad people, evil people? Well, the answer is, is because he's loving. That's why. So with this said, I do want to do my best to answer the question I was given. All right? Why does a loving God allow bad things to happen to good people? And there are a few things. I'm going to rush through these pretty quickly. And probably by the time I'm done, some of you, I don't know, half of you will go, man, that was really great. Half of you are going to go, that was really horrible. That didn't help me. We kicked off the series with that guy? Really? <laughs> I got more questions now than I had before I walked into the series. He's really goofed me up. <laughs> so let me give you a couple thoughts here. And the first one is this. You can write this down. Bad things happen to good people because of sin. And this is the weightiest of them all. I think, and I teach this a lot, that the most important words in all of the Bible are the first five words. In the beginning, God created. First five words of your Bible are the most important words in all of the Bible. Because if you can't get past those first five words and the rest of it, well, it doesn't mean anything. But I think the most important chapter is that every believer ought to know like the back of their hand is Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, and Genesis chapter 3. Because if you don't understand those three chapters, the rest of it is just goobly gock. It didn't mean anything. And in Genesis chapter 1, you know, the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way through the 39th book in the Old Testament, which is Malachi. Then you get to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Church is Born, all the way through the, uh, the 27th book of the New Testament, Revelation. you got to know Genesis 1, 2, and 3. In Genesis 1 and 2, you see what God intended. God creates everything, and it's all good. It's unbelievably good. It's fantastic. In Genesis 1 and 2, you see the very first Bible study ever recorded, and God's the teacher. He says to Adam, Eve hasn't been created yet. He says to Adam, imagine this Bible study. You got coffee. There you are. You're the only dude on the whole planet. There's no Eve. It's just God and you. And God says, you see that tree over there? Yeah. Don't eat from that one. One little verse. Don't you wish the Bible studies that you had, don't you wish the preachers like me just had one little verse? We can't do it. And you get to Genesis 3, and a cataclysmic event happens. Adam is now married, if you will, to Eve. And there comes this moment when Adam says, you know what, I don't care what God said. I don't care what I learned in the Bible study. I like that tree. I think that tree is really cool. And yes, I said the man. God impugns sin on all of us through the man, Adam. And Adam goes over, and he pulls that fruit off of the tree, if you will. Actually, his wife gave him a piece. And there are three words in your Bible in Genesis. Three words. Change everything. Imagine this moment. He's got that piece of fruit. I got to believe that all the angels in heaven were just gathered around. What's he going to do? What's going to happen? God told him not to eat it. And your Bible says this. There are three words. And he Eight. Bam! Everything changed. Three little words. And he ate. And now we have this thing we all have to deal with called sin. Sin brought death. 
The reason why Jesus said in this life you will have troubles is because of those three little words. And he ate. Because of that moment, here we are and you know, 2022, and I don't even know what state or city I'm in. <laughs> I travel all over. This is, I'm in Baltimore. This is where all the big shots are, right? Um, man, we're all goofed up, man, all of us. The reason why, I don't know, babies are born with no arms and no legs or blind is because of and he ate. The reason why we have tornadoes and you know, hurricanes and tsunamis is because of and he ate. The reason why there's robbery and thievery and you know rapes and murders and all that. And he ate. The reason why there are wars and all the, the and he ate. There's coming a moment. It's not down here on this planet when there won't be any hospitals or pharmaceutical companies or you know dentists or you know we won't need a military. We we won't you know we won't need any of that stuff when we get to glory because. Glory is a place where there isn't any sin. Now we have to deal with it, which is why Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble. But one of the reasons why we experience bummers and trials, the reason why bad things happen to us, if you want to call us good people, is because of three little words in your Bible. And... He ate. Changed everything. And so, bad things happen to us, whether we're good or bad, however you want to look at it. But there's another reason. Number two, bad things happen to good people because of the bad choices you and others make. God said to all of us through our brother Paul in Galatians chapter 6, he said, don't be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. You will reap what you sow. And this makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, a lot of the suffering and problems you face in life, even good people, is because you brought it on yourself by the choices that you made or maybe the choices somebody else made. Give me an example. You make a decision to go to the local bar, have a beer. You make the decision after that first one is down the hatch to have a second beer. Then you make the choice to have that third beer. And then you make the choice to maybe have a fourth beer. And then you make the choice to accept the beer your buddy bought you, and now you're on your fifth and sixth beer. You made all those choices. And then you make the choice to get into a car, a 2,000-pound you know, piece of steel that can do 60 miles an hour. And then you make the choice to put your key in the ignition. You make the choice to turn it on. You make the choice to take it out on the road. And maybe the consequence is you get, you know, a DUI. But oftentimes it's way worse than that. Oftentimes you made all those choices and then you run into another car. And I don't understand it all, but the drunk guy or gal always is fine. It's the people in the other car who are dead and maimed 
Because somebody made the choice to drink. Somebody else made the choice to drive. And they're now reaping what they sow. Sometimes the choice is, you know what, I got a beautiful home and you got all this equity in your home and we saw this happen a number of years ago and you didn't follow God's instructions as it related to how to handle your money and so you used your home like an ATM machine and you, you took a bunch of money out because you had to have that ski do, Had to have it. After all, it's only five easy payments. Let me tell you something. I'm in my 60s. I've never had an easy payment. Never. None of them are easy. But then you made a decision, you know, I need to have a, uh, I want to go on this great vacation. And so you slide the credit card again. And you just keep sliding the credit card, sliding the credit card, sliding the credit card. You were watching TV one day. And all of a sudden, in one of those infomercials was a sham wow. And you went, you know what? My, I got to get one of those. They're $19.95, and if I order now, I get two packs. You can stick one of those in your pool, it sucks your whole pool up. I, I don't get it. And so you spend a bunch of money on a sham wow, which you didn't need because you had these things at home called towels. But before you know it, all those easy payments you can't make anymore. And now there's tension in your home between you and your spouse, and you know who's got to hear it all are your kids. You're reaping what you sow, but so are they. They're now having to reap what you sowed. They're now reaping the decisions that you've made. Bad things are happening because you made the decision to do whatever it is. And you, you, could, you could use this any way you, you want. You suffer because of sin and because of the choices you and others make. Uh, number three, bad things happen to good people because of Satan. Our brother Peter penned these words. He said, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, your enemy, your enemy, your enemy, not Pastor Matt's enemy, not the missionary's enemy, not the worship team's enemy, not my enemy. He says, your enemy. He makes this very personal. You have an enemy. And probably most of you woke up this morning and went out and got your post toasties and had your bagels and hey, you didn't even think about the fact you got an enemy, did you? And that's just the way Satan likes it. That's right, don't think about me. You just go about your life. And yet all throughout the scriptures, we're given a scouting report on our enemy. He says he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. And probably half of you in this room could stand up and give testimony of how that lion devoured you, your marriage, your family, your business, or whatever it might have been because you woke up and you didn't even think about the fact you got an enemy out there. And this, this imagery... You've all seen, you know, like those shows, you know, nature shows, where you see the, the lioness. It's all golden colored, and it's walking through these amber, you know, weeds and grain, and it's just walking. And right up there is the wildebeest. He has no clue that there's a 1,500-pound lion with claws ready to take him down. And God says to you, there's an enemy. And right now, he's just prowling around. I wonder how close he is to you right now. Ever thought about that? You woke up this morning, never gave him a thought, man. And he's lurking in the bushes. He just wants to screw up your life. He wants to screw up your marriage. He wants to screw up your kids. He wants to screw up your grandkids. He wants to screw up this church. 
and he's really good at what he does. He's got his PhD in goofing up people's lives. In fact, last night, look, when you went to bed and you were in la-la land and I didn't sleep at all, I can't sleep when I'm in a hotel room. It was a great hotel, don't get me wrong, but I just can't sleep. And you were asleep. He didn't sleep. His demons didn't sleep. They just thought about, hey, how do we get to his life today? How do we get to her life today? Somehow they made it through yesterday, but today's a new day. Paul says in Ephesians 6, he calls them schemes, the, the schemes of the devil. It's like, it's like he's got lures. And you see a little shiny thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, maybe, maybe a praying mother or a praying grandmother or someone praying made you not go for that lure. Mm. Because you certainly weren't praying. You weren't thinking anything about the devil. Oh, he got away. So last night you went to sleep and the demons and the devils just figured out new lures. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Watch this. Watch. Mm. You think you're going after something fantastic and you don't realize there's a barbed hook on the end of it. See, one of the reasons why we're going to suffer is because of sin, ultimately. It's because of the bad choices, but it's also because we've got an enemy out there, and he's like real. He, he, he's real. It's not a joke. And so that's why Peter starts out with those incredible words. Be alert! Are you alert? One of the reasons why bad things will happen to you, whether you think you're good or bad, doesn't matter to me, but one of the reasons why is because you've got a real enemy out there. And last but not least, bad things happen to good people because of their, their faith. Peter said, dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. That one's weird. Sometimes we suffer, sometimes we get kidney punched, sometimes bad things happen to us simply because we're followers of the Lord. And it seems like, you know, Why doesn't the Father just protect us? Why doesn't the Father just kind of watch after us? I don't know. It's one of those secret things. But I do know this. One of the reasons why we have troubles in this life, in this world, is certainly because of sin, the choices that we make, the dumb choices we make. Sometimes it's Satan, but sometimes it's just because you're a, a Christ follower. You know, Jesus said, if you want to be one of my disciples, here's the gig. You have to deny yourself. you got to take up your cross, and then you follow me. That's not really taught in churches much anymore. The cost of following Jesus. You, you, you deny yourself, and that right there, you know, nixes most people. But then you got to pick up your cross. What is, what is he talking about? Well, let me make it a modern day uh, verse. You deny yourself, you pick up your electric chair, or gas chamber, or whatever the method of, you know, killing people is out here. See, the cross was just simply a way the Romans killed people. That was their capital punishment. And so what Jesus said was, deny you, take up your cross. In other words, be willing 
to give up your life for this thing called the faith. And if you're not willing to deny yourself, forget about taking up your cross. Forget about being willing to actually die or suffer for this thing called the faith. In America, we, we don't get it. We just don't get it. So Jesus says, hey, listen, you pick up your gas chamber. In fact, we've, so, we've got this thing so goofed up, you know, we make little cross earrings, we've got little cross necklaces, put little crosses on our car and stuff. Would you, would you wear gas chamber earrings? Would you wear, like, a, an electric chair around your neck? No, my, look, look, I got a, I got a cross necklace. I, I, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. But I, you know what, we put those things on, we, just, we, we come into church and there's a cross and we don't even think about it. Imagine if there was a ginormous electric chair up here. All of a sudden you'd be like, whoa, 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 what are we doing here? Yeah, that's the way our Lord died and he told us all we have to pick up our electric chair you see, when Jesus wrote that, when you pick up your cross, that meant something to those guys. It meant something to those gals. They knew what he was saying, that there's going to be pain and sorrow and suffering as we follow Jesus Christ. We don't experience much of that in the United States. but So these are a few of the, the reasons why bad things happen to good people. And that is, uh, you know, sin, the choices you and others make, Satan, and simply because you're a follower of Christ. And I'm just going to run through these real quick, okay? So let, let, let me just give you a couple practical thoughts here real quick. Number one, while you're here on planet Earth, your loving God will allow bad things to happen to you. But remember, bad things happen to the greatest person ever. That was Jesus. Keep that in mind. Number two. While you're on planet Earth, your loving God will allow bad things to happen to you. But remember, God will use those bad things for his glory and your good. And number three, while you're on planet Earth, your loving God will allow bad things to happen to you. But remember, this ain't it. This ain't it. Someday we're going to get out of here. Father, thanks, Lord, for a chance just to be together and sing these weighty, sacred songs and fellowship together, bring our gifts together, remember you through communion and hear from you in your word. I hope that somehow this was a blessing to people, and I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this journey of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.